So I'm sitting here with uh, Ben Armstrong. Uh, uh, most of the people who watch my video know already Ben is my hero, uh, Mr. Hyper-V. But recently I called you Mr. Microsoft Container, formerly mm. known as Mr. Hyper-V. Is Why is that, Ben? Well, uh, let me just highlight because it's keep on, I keep on talking about containers. But really, I'm Mr. Microsoft Containers, formerly known as Mr. Hyper-V, formerly known as Virtual PC Guy. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, so Getting longer and longer. Yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> the, the, the list goes on. Yeah. So what's, what is so fascinating about uh, containers? Because Microsoft now has also Microsoft containers and even Hyper-V Hyper -V containers. containers. Yes. Uh, so we actually, so we have, right now we have Windows Server containers and Hyper-V containers. And our marketing team is very mad at us because we're going to have to change all our names around because <laughs> we've announced that uh, we're going to be doing native Linux containers which are going to be actually Linux Hyper-V containers, um, okay. which means that our current naming doesn't work. So we have to come up with, because we're going to have Windows Server containers and Windows Hyper-V containers and Linux Hyper-V containers or something like that. We're, <laughs> we're going to have to change the names. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited about containers because, you know, when we, when we first started working on virtual machines, people... There were a lot of people who looked at virtual machines and said, why on earth would I want to use that? Uh, um, we've got physical computers and they work just fine. Mm -hmm. um, and it took us a number of years to get people on board. And uh, honestly, I think the difference between virtual machines and containers is as big as the difference between physical computers and virtual machines. You know, I think we're yeah. going to do amazing and crazy things. Yes. Um, so first, I don't know if everybody knows about a container yet so what it you should what it is you should yes you uh, i should uh, i'm i'm looking at it and you you ask me all the time i should learn containers yeah, ab absolutely yeah. so ben container is usually a thing a, a, a huge thing where you put stuff in and it's on ch huge chips so that <laughs> is a container right the, yes so what is a container in a computer context? And it's co you compared it to virtual machines. Yes. So what is the advantage of a container? So, I mean, the, at a kind of a, a 20,000 foot view, yeah. um, virtual machines and containers look very similar. They're both technologies that allow you to get new copies of operating systems to play with and do things mm -hmm. with. Um, however, when we built virtual machines, uh, we really built them to look and feel like physical computers. Mm -hmm. You know, they have hard drives, they have network adapters, they have video cards, and everything. They have an ISA bus. Yeah. Generation every, 1 has yeah, an yeah, ISA every, bus, every, right? Everything looks and feels like uh, a, a physical computer. Mm -hmm. With containers, um, we kind of noticed, I don't know if you've noticed this, no one really does anything for physical computers anymore. Um, we build things for clouds. Yeah. And so with containers, we kind of went back and said, what does it look like to build a virtualization thing that mm -hmm. is designed for the cloud? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we came up with containers. And it's, it's virtualization at a different layer in the technology stack. There's a whole bunch of different approaches. Um, and the, the results are pretty amazing. You know, the containers use a hugely less memory less CPU, less disk, they're a lot faster, they're, um, and it really can change the way that you think about things. Okay, um, an advantage I see is you are sharing the operating system. So you have one, you have one installation of an operating system and then several containers can use that and build on that, right? Yes. Um, so um, another thing is I, uh, I was so fortunate to see you talk about containers at two different conferences. The first conference was a cloud and data center conference yep. in Munich and you had you had usually an IT pro yep. audience and the second conference is IT camp where we sit now and here are most people developers yep. and you took different approaches to talk about containers. So uh, can you summarize the approach 
what is important with a container for an IT pro or what do they use the Microsoft containers for and what is uh, important for developers? Yeah, so uh, before I go to that, I do want to take a moment to say that you know, while we've been working on containers and working on virtual machines, we spend a lot of time talking to customers and trying to understand what's going on. And honestly, one of the concerning things that we see is we see a lot of companies right now where the developers and their IT staff aren't really talking to each other. Mm, yeah. um, and that's a, that's a problem for everyone. You it know, is. Um, if that's happening in your company, please stop it. Um, <laughs> I, I know it's not fun talking to other people, but you have to work together. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, in a lot of ways, I think uh, containers are a very useful tool to to help bring people to the table and, and talk about it because, um, you know, I, I do talk very differently because, you know, when I'm talking to IT pros and I was, uh, I've, 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 actually it's been fantastic over the last month I've done two very IT pro heavy conferences and I've done two very developer heavy conferences. Um, when I talk to IT pros, I, I like to talk to them about, you know, I'll ask them, Hey, do you have uh, ASP.NET applications in your environment? And most people do. Yeah. Um, and I'll talk about, you know, if you're if you're doing private cloud today and you have ASP.NET applications, if they if they're light load, you know, chances are they're running on virtual machines with two virtual processors, um, two to four gig of RAM, um, and about you know forty to fifty gig. Uh, mm -hmm. of, of storage um, and if you've got a dozen of those you're now looking at about 50 gig of RAM and you know half a terabyte of storage yeah well you can take a dozen you know ASP.NET applications put them in Windows containers on a single Windows Server 2016 virtual machine now you can run that whole workload in 6 gig of RAM and you know you know a like a hundred gig of hard drive, you know, and that's huge. That's you know, uh, yeah. you know, an eight x saving on memory and and so on. And you know, uh, it's been a while since we've had those sorts of efficiency savings. Um, on the developer side, you know, one of the the big things that containers really bring to into play is that um, you can you can. Unlike a virtual machine with a container, you can create a brand new Windows Server container completely clean but completely ready to go in two, three seconds. Uh, and why is that important? Because now develop like all developers know that they should be testing their code in clean environments, yeah. but it's too much effort. You know, and it slows them down too much and so they don't tend to and it introduces problems. Uh, but now they can use containers and it's very easy and lightweight to always create a clean environment to test your application in. And where we see amazing things happening is if we can get the IT pros starting to use containers to get these you know, resource savings, developers start using containers to get efficiency, and then you can start getting a flow where, you know, if you think about it today with virtual machines, if you have, uh, you know, most enterprises have an IT pro, uh, you know, a uh, system admin team, and they have a developer team, and, you know, the development team does their development, but what do they hand off? They hand off binaries and, and mm -hmm. applications that, you know, the sysadmin team then has to install and set up, and there's mistakes, and it's painful, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, you can get to a world where what the development team is handing off is a container. And then just, just, it, just fire it up and it, and it runs. So, so um, when when you developed Container at Microsoft, uh, uh, it was a, a joint effort of your group and uh, I think the Windows uh, Windows Windows Kernel team. Windows I mean, Kernel and we're, team. We're both in. It all came out of the Windows Base team. So we have the Windows Base team that we have a bunch of teams in there um, that we're all in the same building and we all work very closely together. Yeah. So, so um, when you uh, worked on Container, you had a. Uh, a use case in mind for what containers will be probably used and you told me um, you thought of that use case but 
uh, most of the use is something else. So yeah, yeah, can you uh, yeah, explain what, what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the things, you know, I've been, uh, I've been working in, you know, kernel and virtualization technologies for about 20 years now. And uh, in that time, I've been able to, you know, be involved in bringing a number of new technologies to market. And it always makes me laugh because when, when you're building a brand new technology, uh, it's hard to get feedback from users as to what they're going to do with it. You know, mm -hmm. if I had come to you three years ago and tried to describe a container and ask you what you would use it for, um, I don't think that would have been a very useful conversation. No, no, no <laughs> not at all. Um, and so when we're working on first releases, we have to take uh, a lot of guesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were working on containers, um, we really, we really thought that what we were going to see was that we were going to see that containers were only going to be interesting to developers for a while and that we were going to go through a couple of iterations where developers were using it to help them build new applications and only once those applications started getting mature would it start being interesting uh, to more of the ops side and the, the sysadmin mm -hmm. side. Uh, but we've been absolutely amazed that we are seeing huge numbers of IT pros being able to take you know existing .NET and Java applications and drop them in containers and get huge operational savings out of doing that, um, and it's it's blown us away. Um, it's been great to see. Yeah, you even uh, said that a lot of Windows Server 2003 there shouldn't be that that uh, virtual machines or applications anymore because it's not supported, but. Uh, there are companies who have huge success supporting that applications into containers, right? Yeah, which is fantastic. We're very happy to see that. No one should be using Windows Server 2003. Stop it, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no, we have had companies where they had, you know, yeah, the IIS, ASP.NET applications running on mm -hmm. Windows Server 2003, and they were able to bring them across to, to Windows containers on Windows mm -hmm. Server 2016. Um, often with no code changes, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So mm, then you mentioned when we start, started the, the interview that, that there will be three kinds of containers yes. soon in Windows. Yes. Um, so the Linux containers in um, um, the Hyper-V Linux yes. containers, yes. the Windows server containers, and the Hyper-V Hyper -V Windows, Windows server contain containers. Yeah, so we're, so we're still sorting out the name. Yeah. So... Um, I usually talk about Hyper-V, and we talked about Hyper-V a lot in the past. So what is the difference between a Windows container and a Hyper-V container? Yeah, so the when we built containers, we built a whole set of new technology um, to allow us to do virtualization in a new way. And one of the interesting things in doing that is that it allowed us to do it basically allowed us to do virtualization without a hypervisor anymore. So when you use Windows Server containers, you're getting virtual instances of Windows without needing a hypervisor. Mm -hmm. uh, but the hypervisor still has two really important roles to play. Um, the first one is that you know, the hypervisor remains the gold standard of security. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you want security and isolation above all else, then you need a hypervisor. Um, in play. Um, the second thing is that you know the the hypervisor is crucial when you want to be running a different kernel. Um, and so we have customers where you know they just want to run Windows Server on Windows Server and they don't have the you know high security requirement and they can use Windows Server containers. Um, However, we have customers where they want to run Windows Server on Windows Server, but they want to have the security guarantees of a virtual machine. Mm -hmm. um, and Hyper-V containers are great. Um, we all have, so have situations where maybe I want to run Windows Server containers on my Windows 10 laptop, um, in which case I need Hyper-V containers because those are different enough uh, environments. Um, and we're going to be using the same technology to allow you to run Linux containers um, on Windows Server and Windows Desktop. So, um, 
the Hyper-V containers, uh, this was on a requirement of one of your big, of, 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 of my big biggest customer. biggest customer, yeah, biggest customer. Um, who is a very security aware customer, and that is Azure. Yeah. Um, you know, we we worked on Windows Server containers, and when we talked to the Azure team, they demanded that we figure out how to enable. Uh, hypervisor level security for containers and yeah. that's actually what started us down that path. Yeah, and, and I must really thank Azure that yes. they required Hyper-V containers because this enabled another feature that I like a lot yes. uh, and you know what I mean, right? Yeah, I know where you're going. This is we, nested virtualization. Yeah, we asked at the MVP summit uh, a lot of times for nested virtualization and um, you asked us for customer scenarios and I'm so happy that your biggest customer wanted um, Hyper-V containers because you need nested for that. And I'll, I'll be honest, I'm glad that it happened that way too because um, if it hadn't been Azure asking for it, if we'd just done it um, as a side project to make the MVPs happy, yeah, that, um, that wouldn't work. We uh, well, we probably wouldn't have spent as much time as we did trying to make sure that the performance was great and the experience yeah. was great. Because you know, we now have nested virtualization, and everyone I talk to is amazed at how fast it is. That's, and that's right. Yeah. Because we designed it for production on Azure, and we put a lot of hard work into figuring out how to do that in a highly performant manner. Yeah, and we will get very soon a nested virtualization in Azure. Yes, we, yeah, we announced will, that it built. Yeah, that this will in all, uh, um, open a lot of scenarios for, I would say, not the modern world, the world that is still depending on virtualization. So you can, like me, <laughs> I'm an old guy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm very excited about it, but because now I can build a lot of scenarios that are customer used to, yep. like clustering, like storage, synchronous replication, all the all the old stuff. Let's say old stuff the people are doing now, and um, Azure is all about. Um, I would say born in the cloud application and the containers is great for that and you develop for containers but we, we must not forget the old stuff or uh, the stuff that are people uh, working with now and have to because maybe the company who's who had developed their product is not on the market yeah, anymore. absolutely yeah? you know and you know uh, I, in my container session today you know I started it out by talking about like we know that we all have existing applications and we have to continue to support those. We have to continue to maintain those. And you know, so it's one of the things that we're trying to be very mindful of is to ensure that while we're building technologies that allow you to build cool new things, we also want to, and we have to, continue to make it not just possible, but easier to run your existing applications going forward. Hmm. So. I learned some minutes ago um, that you have a private project. Uh, you told me you have running home server uh, at home, right? No, so this is, uh, I've actually, I've blogged about this over the years and I need to, I, I haven't blogged in a while, but I, I run, I've always run a sizable server infrastructure in my yeah, that, house. That I know, yeah. Um, and uh, the last time I blogged about it was uh, after we, just after we released Windows Server 2012 R2. Um, and I'm I'm right in the middle of like trying to figure out what my server infrastructure is going to look like right now, mm -hmm. um, and it's something I enjoy doing because I get to I get to wrestle with a lot of the problems that my customers uh, wrestle with, you know. So um, like one of the big changes that's happened uh, in my home infrastructure is I I now have to manage a hybrid cloud. Because I've started using some services from a local hosting provider. Okay. Um, I used to run my own mail server, and I used to run my own blogs, and I now pay a local hosting provider who gives me a fantastic uh, price. I no longer run those on my server, so I run less stuff locally. Um, but now I have the problem of I have different management experiences and so on, and so I'm trying to figure out um, what that looks like. Um, now, me being the crazy container obsessed person that I am. Um, I would love to get all of my infrastructure over to containers, uh, but you'd never believe this. I do have some apps that don't run in containers. 
Um, God, so I believe that. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. Um, and so I'm, I'm right in the middle of trying to figure out for myself, um, what am I going to put in containers? What am I going to put in virtual machines? What am I going to use uh, hosted services for? And most crucially, how on earth am I going to manage all of this and uh, not go insane? Yeah. Um, so that's uh, when you came over, I was tinkering with and playing with ideas and so on. Yeah. So um, I was I was thinking um, when you develop containers, or usually containers are known for a stateless, stateless. So you fire up a container, you use it for something, and when you destroy it or uh, put it down, the data is gone. So you have to store your data somewhere else, maybe in a past uh, past SQL or, or whatever. But when you told us a lot of uh, applications are moved to containers and we have even SQL for containers they are not stateless anymore so Correct. Ha we have some new um, challenges there right yeah and I mean uh, kind of a, a two-part answer here the first one is when it, like I, I containers are a brand new technology yeah. um, and I always get grumpy when people make sweeping architectural statements about brand new technology because we don't know we might be wrong people like people use our technology in ways that we don't expect yeah. all the time um so i i've always got grumpy when people have been like oh containers are stateless and they're used for this sort of apps and i've always been like well actually why don't we wait and see mm -hmm. um and sure enough you know people pe yes they work great for stateless apps but people are absolutely using them for stateful apps um, that said, you know, one of when I see customers moving um, stateful applications into containers, um, what I see happening, which is a great thing, is I do see that as part of that move, people are taking the time to separate out the application and the data. Yeah. Um, and they put the data on in a separate location and they use docker volumes to to map that in so that they can now start to go like okay you know yes this is a you know a quote unquote stateful application but we now have this is the part that's stateless that we can create and destroy and recreate and so on and this is the part that's actually the data that we care about mm. um, because at, at the at the end of the day i've one of the jokes that i've made is um I, I don't believe that there are many applications that are truly stateless. Mm -hmm. What I believe is there are plenty of applications where, as the application owner, the state is not my problem. Okay. You know, because quite often when you talk to people and they're like, oh, this application is stateless, um, one of my first questions is, does it talk to a database by any chance? And they're like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, good people say like it's a stateless web application. It's talking to a big database on the back end, and what they're really saying is the state is not my problem. Mm -hmm. That's someone else's problem to me. That brings me to uh, to one question I had before, and you had a solution for that. So uh, when we talk about stateful containers, um, people tend to like to back up them to to preserve the state when something is happening with the container. And you said there is a solution for that because uh, until uh, now uh, a container has not the backup interface that a virtual machine has. But you, the sol solution is if you have a container with stateful information, you put it where? Well, so or you uh, could uh, put it yeah, there. Uh, but before we get there, I do want to be. I don't want to mislead anyone. the The topic of, of of containers and backup is still is still very much the wild west. We're still trying to yeah. figure out, you know, what makes sense and and what's the the right approach. There are absolutely containers where and applications that you can put in containers where the right story for backup is what you backup is the scripts and process to rebuild the container. Mm -hmm. And it's more of a source control than uh, than a backup. Um, there are lots of container applications that we see out there where um, you know people put the the stateful part of the application just on uh, you know in a folder and they map it in with uh, Docker volumes and backup becomes just doing a file level backup mm -hmm. um, of that folder. You know the the old X copy uh, backup. Um, but there are also lots of places where people are using databases, and most databases actually have their own native backup 
um, capabilities and support. You know, we see people using SQL and using the the SQL native backup interfaces, mm -hmm. uh, which all works. Uh, you know, when it, it when it's running inside of a container. Yeah, but maybe you have a Windows Server 2003 application that don't have an, uh, a backup interface, so there would be a solution to put it in a virtual machine and backup that, yes, right? Yes, absolutely, and that's, that's one of the... Not that it's the end goal, that that is the backup story, but it, it will help uh, now to... to yeah, uh, and, and the key detail here is, and there's a lot of things that we, uh, that we discuss where um, we haven't really solved it yet because, fortunately, most people do run containers inside virtual machines. Mm. Of course, in thinking about my home setup, I'm going to be running containers on bare metal because it's the sort of person I am. Um, I like you go to the hard way. I like to make life hard for myself. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was today in a Kubernetes session, and uh, I must confess, uh, I heard about Kubernetes a lot. Um, until I would say half a year ago, I didn't know what Kubernetes is doing. Um, Kubernetes is, is something Google uh, open sourced yep. now. And <clears throat> I learned in the session that Google is doing everything in containers, yes. even their virtual machines. Yes. And that is for me, as a guy who, who coming from hardware into virtual machines, a complete different concept. Uh, so that would mean uh, a virtual machine can run in a container. Yep. We talked about Hyper-V containers. Yep. There a container uses the Hyper-V yep. isolation technology, right? Yeah, uh, there, are, there are a lot of people who like to look at containers and virtual machines and imagine that these are very isolated separate technologies and the reality is it's a lot more gray okay um, there's a lot of interchangeable technology and there's a lot uh, on the engineering team there's a lot of times that we spend discussing like you know in the future what's going to be the difference between virtual machines and containers and and what's this actually going to to look like and there's a, there's a lot of open questions there you know there's you know from a technical reason there's no reason why you couldn't run virtual machines in containers or containers in virtual machines or containers in containers and virtual machines in virtual machines it's all about trying to figure out what makes the most sense for our customers yeah but wouldn't you lose one of the key advantages of container the sharing of the operating system or lower layers so that What, what I get at a, at a big advantage is you have one Windows Server image and you share it with your containers. So that, you have that, a lot of savings and we talked about and that. And that, that is one advantage. But another advantage, which is, I, I believe, one of the big reasons why Google went with the path that they did, is that containers are a great way to get a very quick, clean environment to run your things in. Okay. Um, and so they're, they're interested in, in that angle and being able to just very get get quick, clean environments for, for running things, even if those things are virtual machines. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question is, I already talked uh, asked or talked about Kubernetes, and there are others like Docker Swarm uh, and, and Mesosphere. Doc, Docker Data Center. Docker Data Center. And, and uh, of course, uh, the Azure Container Service Fabric. Yeah, and... Uh, There is one more, I think, Mesosphere. Mesosphere so with the, the DCOS. Yeah, what is that? So uh, it's what, not container; it's more. Or so what? All, what all of these are, uh, you know, and this is, you know, if you remember back in the day, you know, we we, you know, first released Virtual Server and Hyper V, and it was great. You could create virtual machines, and it was really exciting. But then, what happened when you had four or five servers running twenty virtual machines? How did you manage them? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where we develop System Center. Um, but, you know, all of these are, they are enterprise grade container management mm -hmm. and orchestration engines so that, you know, if, if you're, if you're like me and you're going to be running a dozen containers on one or two servers in your house, you probably don't need any of these. Uh, but if you're an enterprise where you're looking at, okay, the end goal is we're going to have a cluster of you know, eight physical servers running hundreds of containers mm -hmm. and we need to be able to make you know, SLA statements and so on, then you're definitely going to want one of these pieces of software to monitor and orchestrate and oversee the containers in your environment. And that's what they're really about.
Mm -hmm. So what I learned, one advantage of, of containers is to, if you need, if you have more demand, you can e quickly sp uh, spin up more of those containers yep. uh, and uh, maybe one container dies and you have to shoot up another so one and so on. So this is one so what, I, what I was fiddling with when you came over is I was trying to put together a reverse web proxy and play with scaling containers up and down because... <laughs> That's how you roll, right? You know, uh, you, I have a lot of dynamic <laughs> workload in my household. and uh, <laughs> give, me, give, me, uh, give me an example about your dynamic workload. Okay, okay. Actually, it doesn't happen in my household. No, but yeah, I, 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 like the I, I wanted to play with yeah, it. Of course. And that's, that's what I was fiddling with, actually, <laughs> uh, when you came across. Okay, Ben. This was a nice interview. It had to... It had nothing to do about Hyper-V features. We right. Well, Hyper-V hyper is in there, right? Hyper-V. It is. Or is it a lot? It's a lot. <laughs> okay. So thank you for the interview. And yes. uh, we see each, we have seen each other this month. We've, it was we've a seen lot, far right? too much of each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Always good to chat.